Good morning. This is Jim Moore, and you are watching Words of Encouragement. It is January 23rd, 2023, so we got double 23s today. And this is episode 591. Thank you for taking the time uh, to join me this morning. going to talk about some things that the Lord is doing in the world. going to talk about some things He's doing in you, and pray that it helps you and encourages you to move forward in the things of the kingdom. So again, this is uh, the title of the, the message today uh, is that broken but not crushed, the, the dealings of the Holy Spirit in our lives and what the Lord wants to do. So, Father, I pray that you will move upon people's hearts today and encourage them to hear what it is that you have to say to them today through your servant. In Jesus' name, amen. So, amen. There's my lovely Linda. So as we're just getting started here today, uh, giving time for some people to come on, I want to uh, just uh, say a big thank you, a shout out. Yesterday, we got to minister at a uh, probably a little known place uh, around the country, but known here in this area. It's called Hot Hop, H-O-T-H-O-P, and that stands for Heart of Texas. That's the hot part. And then H-O-P is House of Prayer. So Heart of Texas, out of prayer, House of Prayer. And we just had a wonderful time. What a great group of people. Hi, Dana. Hi, Kevin. Glad you joined me this morning. Um, a lot of good things that the Lord is doing with that uh, group of people. And if you are in the Austin area at all, you know, within a 100-mile radius or whatever, uh, join them. They have a church service every Sunday morning, and then they have prayer meetings that they do uh, in the week, during the week. So uh, David... And Bethany Martin, wonderful people, becoming good friends of ours. So I had a great meeting yesterday. And I want to talk a little bit about what the Lord uh, did there yesterday, because I think it is very pertinent to uh, what he spoke to me this morning to bring to you. And as you know, I, I have a great um, sense of value for the Bible, for the words of God. I do still believe it is the word of God. A lot of people don't. It's kind of like just a collection of men's thoughts and women's thoughts and their ideas about God and blah, blah, blah. I don't believe that. I believe that the scripture itself teaches us. Jesus himself taught us. His words never end. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words, okay, and my words in the life of Jesus, and not just what he spoke while he walked the earth, but he is called the word. He was called the word before he was ever named Jesus and born of a virgin. The words of God, he said, my words, heaven and earth will pass away, my words will never pass away. That means his words are on a completely different and higher level than the words of man. So don't get the two confused, right? So I have a great value system when it comes to the words of God. When I read the Bible, I read it as God talking, okay? God talking. Now, that doesn't mean there's not some... I don't know, hey, Angie, God bless you. Uh, the, you know, I'm, I'm not saying there's not personality in there, but it is the Word of God. So what I said to this little group of people yesterday is what I'll tell you right now, that anytime anybody preaches or teaches the Word of God, and they do it with accuracy, rightly dividing the Word. I mean, there's some crazy interpretations. We all get that. I mean, you know, if you ever play the game Telephone, where you say something, hi Linda, you say something to your neighbor, you all sit in a circle and one person, maybe you've never played this before, one person says, whispers a phrase like, I am not afraid or whatever to their neighbor. And then they keep whispering it to the next person. By the time it gets all the way around the circle and back to the person that actually said it, it usually is entirely distorted and says something completely different depending on how the people perceived it. So the Bible can happen that way, right? So when I say teaching matters every time, it's God's word, it does. But you still have to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, in addition to that, I believe that God speaks to us about people's circumstances and their situations. We call that a prophetic, prophetic gifting, prophetic utterances, prophetic preaching, prophetic praying, prophetic fill in the blank next to it, like, for example, prophetic praying. So if you have ever had this experience, you kneel down next to somebody up at the altar. We don't do altar calls anymore, which is a shame, but let's say you do, and you're kneeling down next to them and you're praying for them, and you're just praying whatever's coming to you, right? You're just, 
I mean, we don't know what to say. We don't know what's going on in their lives. So what are we doing? We're just, we're not really always thinking about getting inspiration about how to pray. We're just praying what's in our heart. And then suddenly that person turns to you and the prayer's all over. Hi, Tom. And they say, wow, you prayed exactly what I'm going through. And you're like, I had no idea. I wasn't even trying to interpret what you were going through. That is what we call prophetic, right? Prophetic praying. So the prophetic is you can prophetic preach, prophetic sing, prophetic pray, uh, even in a conversation with somebody. So what I had expressed to the people yesterday when I ministered was that when I go to a, a church or a house of prayer or a home group or whatever, any kind of assembly of people, I like to ask the Lord for a, a word. Now, if I just got up and picked the scripture or felt impressed to pick a scripture and, hey, Debbie, and uh, just spoke about that scripture, even if it wasn't the Lord, you know, saying this is a specific prophetic word for this house. It would still have value, right? Because it is the word. Those are still the words of God. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. There's always value. And I think anytime we teach and preach, there's value. But I like it when God says, here's something specific for you, for the person you're ministering to. And sometimes that happens without the person even knowing, the, the person that's speaking even knowing. So I prayed and I asked the Lord for something for Hot Hop yesterday. And I said, Lord, I really like something. Now, he doesn't always do it, right? Okay, you don't, you can't put God in a box and say, you must. I demand you must do this. But lots of times he'll give me a dream for that church or that group or that house of prayer. And he did yesterday, uh, the night for, for last night. Uh, he gave me a dream about them. And I just wanted to give a quick testimony about this because... It so encouraged my heart. Hey, Gene, God bless you. And I know it's going to encourage you too because the Holy Spirit's dealings with us sometimes are really unperceived. And we are living by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. And when things come to crush us, when things come to try to break us, you know, it, you've heard me say before, Satan always has a like a method that he has and a something that he wants to bring out of that, right? He wants to bring something out of that. Well, you can bet your bottom dollar that whatever you go through, God has something that he wants to give you through that, that you wouldn't have gotten uh, otherwise. In other words, if you have to go through what you're going through, the Lord is going to give you something on the tail end of that, that you lots of times can't even perceive until it happens. So let's tell you real quick what happened with this little group. So I had a dream about two waitresses and a baby. That's all I'm going to go into. But what happened is as I'm sitting in their service, getting ready, we're doing worship. We come to the end of worship and uh, I'm going to get to the scripture. Just hold on a minute. We come to the end of worship and uh, I'm ready to, I'm getting my laptop ready to go preach and everything. And a young lady named Amy steps up and she begins to share what had happened to her just the day before. And I'm telling you, I almost jumped out of my seat. I turned to Linda because I had told Linda about the dream on the way there. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of dreams. So, you know, she's very kind to listen. Thank you, honey. And um, but it so matched my dream. I had a dream about waitresses and a baby. This young lady, Amy, had been to a restaurant, same as my dream, had talked to a waitress who was kind of down and out, same as my dream. And the Lord just gave her the right words to speak to this young lady to help her, same as my dream. I mean, <clears throat> We don't understand how what we do affects eternal things. Now, if you believe that what you do has no value, you won't do it. You must wrestle with your belief system. And I am saying wrestling because I wrestle. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, 40 years, and I still have times that I feel doubt. Like, am I really useful for the Lord. And you know what? I don't care how big a platform you have, how many people you reach, you know, well, you did that one time you have this big service and 10,000 people were there. I mean, I, I think I preached to about 5,000 people. It doesn't matter. None of that really matters. What matters is today. What matters is how I'm living today. As a matter of fact, one of the things that happened to me was the Lord spoke to me about a movie. I won't go into all of it, uh, about a movie where uh, an individual in the movie was an ex-football player who kind of, you know, was trying to relive his glory days and come back 
to that. And the Lord spoke, spoke really sharply to someone in the room, and I, maybe to you know all of us, when he said, quit trying to reinvent the back. Quit trying to go back to your glory days. And uh, the power of God fell when I said that. Quit going back. To, quit try, reliving. Quit thinking back then and all of that. You know, what the Lord would say to you today is, hey, today is today. I'm not nearly, I'm not concerned about reliving the past. And in this movie, this guy was trying to be this pro football player that he used to be or whatever. And the Lord said, stop doing that. You're missing what I'm trying to do in you today because you're trying to somehow relive the past. Now, if the Lord wants you to go back to the past, he'll do that. He can do that. Okay. But he says, it's time for you to live now, today, for me, the best you can and do what I tell you to do today. My philosophy of, of life in ministry is that I get up every day Yesterday's gone. Paul said that yesterday's gone. I'm, I'm not looking back. I'm looking forward. What do you want to do to me today? What do you want to do with me and through me? I love what I heard one preacher say. He said, you know, a servant doesn't come to their master every day and start telling them what the servant wants the master to do. Okay, we get that backwards, right? <laughs> Can you say amen? <clears throat> so I, that really struck me because there's always time to do that. There's always time to say, Lord, you know, we have not because we ask not. So Lord, I'm praying Save my son, save my daughter. Lord, I need these finances. Open this up. You know, yes, yes, 100% yes. But I like to start out saying, I'm here, Lord. Jesus, here I am. You're the Lord. You are master of my very existence. I love you so much. I want to do what you want me to do. What would you have me to do today? And, and that's it. And then I do my best to listen throughout the day. If he wants me to work, I work. If he wants me to love on my wife, I do that. If he wants me to go to the doctor, if he wants me to pray for a sick person, it doesn't matter. I'm not trying to create something. I'm trying to listen and obey. So <clears throat> this is easy when everything's going great. And so the message, the dream that I had and the message that I gave to these people was about that. It was about a person who was very busy, but they stopped long enough to allow the Holy Spirit to minister through them to someone else. And then the lady that got up, Amy, she actually had done the very thing. That, it was so stunning. So God is with you. Are you listening to me? God is with you. I don't care what your situation is. I don't care how broken you feel right now. That doesn't change the fact that God is with you. He said, I will never leave you. Now, either he keeps his promise or he's a liar. And if he's a liar, you know, let's go do something else, right? But he's not a liar. He's with you. The problem is sometimes we, the dealings of the Holy Spirit are difficult for us to see. And I'm going to get into the scripture in John chapter 16. I'm going to tell you the eternal words of Jesus that no matter if we believe them or not, one day we'll stand and look at his face. Literally, you'll look at his face like you're looking at mine. And, and he'll say, yeah, that was true. And we'll go, Lord, it was true. I'm sorry I didn't believe you. Okay, we need to believe. That's his foundation. We need to believe his words. And I know we all say we believe him, right? But we go through things that try to crush us, that try to break us. And it's hard when we go through those things to always believe. Now, before I launch into John, I put a link on the very last of this. It's only one. It's from Morningstar. Doesn't matter to me if you like them or don't like them. That's irrelevant. What matters is what they're speaking I do like them. I think they're speaking the truth. Now, this is a, a one of the leaders there. I always mess up his name. I think it's Justin. I mean, maybe you remember. You can you can say, but uh, they kind of trade preachers. Chris will preach one time. Um, you know, different ones will preach. Uh, Rick and so on. Anyway, this young man, I believe this is a different kind of prophetic word. Okay, I am hundred percent prophetic. Believe in that. Believe in giving people personal prophetic words. This is not that. This is different. So this is him declaring a condition, and it matches what the Lord spoke to me this morning. Now, it starts about 46 minutes in. If you don't have time to go through all the worship and everything, about 46 minutes in, they introduce uh, this young man, Justin. Is it Justin Perry? Is that right? <laughs> anyway, he preaches for about 40, 45 minutes, something like that. He really hits on what I believe the Lord has shown me many, many Christians are going through right now. If you're watching this program, 
the chances are, yeah, Justin, I don't remember his last name. Thanks, son. Uh, the chances are about 90% of you are going through this crushing time. Okay? The working of the Holy Spirit in the world depends on you. No pressure. <laughs> now, obviously, it's not all on you. But the working of the Holy Spirit in the world. Now, God can do things without our cooperating. Okay? Cooperation means to cooperate. One person is operating, and then another person is. There are two people operating. So when it talks about cooperating with the Lord, we're saying the Lord is operating. The Holy Spirit is operating. He's doing something. And he looks for human bodies to do it through. Now, you read the stories about the Muslims in, uh, in various countries, Iran and Iraq and Egypt, who are having all these dreams, people in China and so on, not just Muslims. But there, it's a fascinating scenario right now where so many people are having dreams of the man in white. This is becoming just almost comically common. That's a wrong way to say it. But you know what I'm saying. It's becoming an extremely common thing for these men and women to go to bed at night. They have no knowledge of Jesus. They have a dream. And they say, and the man in white says, do you know who I am? Variations of this. Do you know who I am? And they're like, no. And he says, I am Jesus. I'm the creator of heavens and the earth. I came. I mean, literally, Jesus preaches the gospel. It's Jesus preaching Jesus to somebody. Why is that? Because Now, listen. I mean, it, it may have more than one reason, but I think the primary, my opinion, is the primary reason this is happening is because we're not doing it. He calls us, go into all the world and preach the gospel. It is still, you must be born again. It is still heaven. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There, these things are all still as valid as they've ever were. And God loves humanity so much, so much, John 3, 16. And he's telling us to go out and preach this. Preach the love of God. Preach the righteousness. Don't just preach what you want to preach. Preach it all, okay? Because Jesus did, and that means you do too, right? And so people are having this. Now, there's a cooperating element that God wants to do. Now, he can do it all by himself, but he wants to do it through human beings who can say, this is what God did for me. And in the dream I had when I went to Hot Hop that the Lord gave me that was matched by a young lady who had just lived my dream, okay, was cooperating. Now, what does that mean to you who are being crushed, okay? There needs to come a shift in the way you perceive your current situation. Now, understand that this audience that I'm talking to, it could be everything from total debilitation, total, uh, I mean, really crushing. The Bible says, Paul talked about being uh, broken, but not crushed, okay? Or some people say crushed, but not broken, whatever. I don't go into that. The idea is, like Jesus said, <clears throat> if you fall on the rock, you're going to be broken, okay? If the rock falls in you, you're going to be crushed. And that's simply talking about, there's a couple of things there. Number one, you're not going to get away from this refining process, no matter what. If you fall on the Lord, it's going to be a lot easier. You will be broken. Now, think about that. Think about what he said. Fall on the Lord and you'll be broken. Hooray! <laughs> Are you listening? The, the fact of the matter is, even without God, even without God, there's breaking and there's crushing in life. There just is. Okay? Job said it this way, man's days are full of trouble, surely as the sparks fly upward. You cannot find a passage in the Word of God that says, hey, it's always going to be great. Okay, There's always an element of refining. And part of the reason for doing this is so that you can become someone that ministers to others without damaging them or further further damaging them and so on. So I'll get into that in just a minute. But the idea is that if you fall on the Lord, you're still going to go through a breaking process, right? And if you don't fall on it, if you like keep him at arm's length and say, nope, not going to do it. Going to be my own God. Going to go my own way. I want this. I want this. You know what I'm saying? Then you're not going to escape. It's, it's actually going to be harder is what he's saying. You can't avoid the process, the breaking process. Fall on the rock. You'll be broken. You can't avoid it. He says, but you can minimize how difficult it has to be. Now, again, please remember that when we're talking to people, if you stand in a group of a thousand people or if a hundred people watch this program, there's always someone that's going through something worse than you are. 
even if you're at the one extreme end. Let's say that you are lying in bed and you are completely immobilized and all you can do is barely speak the name of Jesus. That's one serious extreme. Other extreme is you're healthy and you're happy and your family's surrounding you and you're living life and it's like the favor of God. Okay, so it doesn't matter what end of the spectrum or where you are in between. This message belongs to you because you're going to go through disappointment. You're going to go through brokenness. I've seen more people backslide from disappointment than any other thing, more than addiction, more than immorality. But the crushing that can happen sometimes when someone betrays you, when your body fails, uh, whatever the disappointment might be, you're in the ministry one day and you're out the next, it really doesn't matter. Disappointment often leads to despair. You say, well, how do I deal with that? Well, it is about what you believe. Okay, there's always the question mark. Why are you doing this? Why? And we, again, why are you, God, doing this? And we need to realize most of the time it's not God. Okay, I remember somebody dying from cancer and then somebody having a dream of them going into heaven and they watched Jesus greet this person who died of cancer coming into heaven and this person asked the same thing they asked when they were alive. Lord, why did you let me die of cancer? And here's the phrase the Lord said to them. Are you ready? He said, when an enemy, now he's talking to the lady that died of cancer, Jesus, and he said, when, when an enemy invaded your body, I had two choices. I could either take you home or, or heal you and leave you there. I chose to bring you home. Now, <clears throat> like it, don't like it, good, bad, ugly, it doesn't matter. He's the Lord. He gets to say. So that's belief number one. Am I okay saying, Lord, okay, I'm going to fight for my healing. I'm going to fight for my finance. I'm going to fight for whatever. But in the end, if you don't empower something, you know, it's going to have to be you. Okay, and we know that, right? If we, if we could make it happen, we'd do it, right? Okay, so the Lord said, but here's the phrase, here's the phrase, here's the other issue about what you believe. He said, when, Jesus said to this woman, when an enemy invaded your body. He didn't say, you know, honey, I gave you cancer because I wanted to teach you something. That's not what he said. He called it what it was, an enemy. And sickness is an enemy. Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the enemy. He labeled sickness as an oppression. Doesn't necessarily mean you're doing something wrong or you're at fault. We can do stupid things and, and get, you know, injured or debilitated or, you know, cut your hand off. You can't blame the devil for that. You know, you know what I'm saying? He called it what it was. And yet, for whatever reason, he didn't do what that person won. Now, what am I saying? You must deal with the issue of disappointment and not. You have to act in the opposite spirit. You have to be a little bit intelligent, right? Okay. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying this in a harsh, critical way. You have to be intelligent about your situation. Not, okay, now listen close. I am going to get to this, these verses. God help me. Okay. I'm not talking about intelligent, about figuring out why you're going through it. That will come in due season. I guarantee you, at some point in this life or after, it will come that you will fully understand what you're going through, okay? But until you do. So when I say be intelligent, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about spiritual intelligence in a way that maybe most people don't think about. Okay, here it is. Whatever your situation, you're sick, your, your spouse left you, okay? Uh, your kids are awry, <laughs> you know? Uh, death, I think, is one of the hardest things, but, you know, sometimes, whatever, whatever. It doesn't matter how big it is or how small it is. It doesn't matter how big it is to somebody else or how small it might be to you. It's your situation. Okay, take your situation and ask yourself two questions. Are you listening? Ask yourself two questions. This is what I'm talking about. Until, what do we normally ask? Why, 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 why? And there's nothing wrong with asking that. Everybody does it. However, I believe these two questions are more important than why is this happening to me? All right. Again, there's a lot of perspective. All right, here it is. Number one, what, not why, but what does the devil want me to do as a result of this situation? A lot of people 
this is 40 years in the ministry talking. A lot of people never ask that question. And I believe this is the most important. Because you see, for us, we just want to get out of it. Okay, We don't want to be broken, fall on the Lord and be broken. We don't want to be crushed. We don't want any of it. We just want to get through. We just want to be done. Understandable. Totally understandable. Okay, No criticism. Okay, But what's more important than you getting out of it is how you respond to it while you're in it. Okay, you get what I'm saying. Okay, what would a profit the whole the what would a profit a man or a woman if they gain the whole world? In other words, you get what you you want getting out of this situation. What would a profit if you get that but you lose your own soul? And I'm telling you, many people, and I know you don't think you're the one that would ever fall away from the Lord, but there have been people greater than you that have fallen away from God because of disappointment. Are you listening to me? Hi Tanya, hi Teresa, I love you guys. All right, listen to me. There are people that have fallen away from the Lord who are, were more anointed, more holy, <laughs> greater people than you and I that have fallen away from the Lord because of disappointment or other things. So what you do when you're going through it is way more important than why you're going through it. And yet our initial response is always, why, 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 why? And what does that mean? Okay, put on your thinking cap for a minute. It means we're trying to figure out why we're going through it so we don't have to go through it again. Again, normal, that's, however, that is not as important. You want to learn the lesson, right? You know, somebody said you don't ever fail God's test. You just keep going through them until you until you pass. That's true. And that, that involves understanding the cause of your situation and the solution and all that. But while you're doing that, while you're trying to figure it out, which may take you the rest of your life or it may take you till next week. Hey, Rick, while you're trying to figure out the crushing, what you're doing in the midst of it is more important. Why? So question number one, I said there's two big questions. Bigger than why is what? Okay, that's my phrase today. Bigger than why is what? What does the devil, Slewfoot, the serpent, Apollyon, Abaddon, the dragon, what does my enemy want me to do? What does the devil want me to do while I'm going through this? And you should really just stop and think about it. You pull out a piece of paper. Put, you know, devil on one side and Jesus on the other side. You know, the two little angels on the shoulder thing, okay? Are you listening? This is really important. I know it may not sound like it is, but it really is. I'm in this situation. I am flooded with challenge and difficulty. My mind is overwhelmed with the thing I'm going through. And I think about it. And you can tell because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And every time you talk to somebody, it's just coming out of you all the time, all the time, all the time. I'm not saying it's that's normal, okay, because it consumes us. And all this stuff I'm talking about and thinking about, I, I need to stop and ask the question, what does the enemy want? What does the devil want me? How does he want me to respond to this? And really write it down. Well, he wants me to be, he wants me to be in despair. He wants me to think God is not good. I mean, just think about what he wants. It's not, this is legal to do. I know people are, don't, don't think about the devil. Oh, no, no, yeah, oh, no, no, no. Think about the Lord. Well, that's coming. That's, that's question number two. But it's good for you to know, what does my enemy want? And then question number two, what does God want? What does Jesus, how does he want me to respond? Not, not necessarily the end thing, okay? Stop looking at the end. The end is going to come soon enough. Think about right now. How am I supposed to respond right now? What should I do in the midst of this unfolding crisis? And that, that somebody right now is listening right now. You are in an unfolding crisis. And you're saying, what am I supposed to do? Well, you're trying to fix it. Most, if you're like me, if you're like most of us, you, you're trying to fix it, right? You're, and that's, that's, again, that's normal. But here's the question. What does my enemy want me to do while this crisis I'm in? Is unfolding or I've been in it for a long time and it's not going to what does my enemy well he wants what does he want me to do with this mouth think about it okay I'm not trying to be harsh think about it give time to think what does he want he wants me to speak negativity he wants me to speak unbelief he wants me to speak that it's always going to be this way he wants me to constantly articulate how hard of a time I'm at I see people do this on Facebook all the time it's it's important that we ask people to help us but they're just vomiting out their, their stuff all the time about how hard it is and nobody gets me and nobody... Listen, listen, there's a difference 
between asking for help and saying, I'm really going through a hard time right now, and just letting your mouth regurgitate the constant thing that the enemy is coming against you with. I'm trying to be nice about this, but I'm saying words create worlds, and sometimes we just need to put a lock on it. What does my enemy want me to do? Well, what did the children of Israel do? They complained, okay? I've complained lots of times. Amen. God doesn't really like that. Why? Because he's mean and terrible and awful. No, but because of what it does to you. Are you listening? Again, this is another mind shift. We need to remember God doesn't like certain things because of what they do to you. It's not because he's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm up here and I'm so offended whenever. No, it's because of what it does to you. So if God hates complaining, it's because of what it creates in you. Complaining is when we verbalize this assault that's going on in our mind about why we're going through what we're going through. So what did, question number one, what does my enemy want me to do? Question number two, what does Jesus want me to do? Separate it. Make sure you're clear on one and clear on the other. Okay, what does my enemy want me to do? He wants me to open my mouth and constantly verbalize about what a bad situation I'm in. Constantly. It's true. You are, right? No, I mean... And we ought to have compassion on one another for the stuff we go through. But you need to ask, is that helping? Is it helping me to constant? Well, I'm not complaining. I'm just telling people, okay, okay, you, you have to figure that out. All right. <clears throat> so here's the two questions. Okay. What is my, how does my enemy wish for me to react in my current situation? You've lost something. Something is taken from you, betrayal, sickness, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter. What does my enemy want me to think about this? What does he want me to speak about this? How does he want me to act? How, you know, many people withdraw from all of the sources that help them get through the struggle because they're tired, because their faith, he wants me to lose my faith. He wants me, you know, all right. So then what does God want? Make sure you're clear on one. Okay, you know what uh, um, spiritual warfare 101 is? Find out what the enemy wants to do and do the opposite. Do the opposite. Ooh, man, I feel the Lord right there. If there was ever a truth, that's it right there. S spiritual warfare 101, find out what your enemy wants you to do and do the opposite thing. That's, that's a word right there for somebody. Find out what your enemy wants you to do and do the opposite. Most people I know never even think about what the enemy is trying to do in them when they're going through a crisis. They, don't, they only think about the God side, and that's true. And then, yeah, find out, I would say the second half to that, find out what God wants you to do. How can you act in the opposite spirit? How can you do the opposite thing? How can you confess what isn't, isn't even happening for you right now? How can you declare, thus saith the Lord, I will not die but live, I will not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. He will never leave me or forsake me. I am not born for this. This is not my destiny. Start declaring what God says. All right? But you got to know what he says. And part of knowing what he says is knowing what your enemy says so that you could do the opposite. I'm going to say one more time. I'm going to read the scripture and be done. Spiritual Warfare 101, find out what your enemy wants you to do and do the opposite. Write that down and stick it on your mirror in the bathroom so you see it every morning as you're putting on your makeup or brushing your teeth, okay? Realize, and I'm talking about as it pertains to crisis, okay? We are broken, or excuse me, we are crushed, but we're not broken, okay? Quit confessing how broken you are, okay? I know we get broken. Jesus said so, right? Fall on me and you'll be broken. You can't avoid brokenness, okay? But it doesn't mean it's the end, okay? It just means you're living life, okay? You're living what, he says, the same afflictions you're going through, Paul said, Holy Spirit said through Paul, he says, are, are being accomplished right now in your brethren, okay? There is no trial that's taken you, but such as is common to man. We're all going through this stuff together. There's a remedy, okay? It's not so important how you get out of it as how you Act when you're going through it, because you are going through it. This is not forever. It might end in your passing. It might end in your deliverance. Of course, it matters to us which way we want it to. We want it to end now, right? For sure, for sure. 
Okay, but ultimately, it's how I walk through this, not how I get to the end. All right, let me read these scriptures. I hope that helped. John 16, again, the Holy Spirit uh, has something to say. This is what he said in John. This is what Jesus said in John 16. He's talking to you. As surely as he was talking to John, Peter, Nathaniel, as surely he was talking to these, these simple, broken, happy, sad, good, bad men. They were just men, okay? Men and women that God chose, okay? Just like you and I. Jesus said these words to you when he said it to them. That's what I want you to hear. These things I have told you that when the time comes, now the time comes, he's talking about him dying, the worst thing they ever had or ever would go through. Okay? And I know I've said it in my life, different times, different seasons. Okay? You've said it in your life. No one's criticizing that. This is the worst thing I've ever gone through. Okay? Until maybe the next thing. <laughs> You know, it's, I'm, I know, I understand. I really do. I really understand. The worst thing that these guys had ever gone through, or, or in their case, probably ever would go through, was the death of Jesus. I mean, we just can't. If any of you have been watching The Chosen, if you haven't been, be, I know I really encourage you to. Don't criticize. You know, none of them are perfect. Whatever. Don't. But it's really good. And anyway, walking with him. Miracles. I mean, all of you can remember great things that God has done before you, and then all of a sudden you're launched into a bad situation, and you're wondering why, and you want to know how to get out of it. Okay, shift your thinking. This is what Jesus is saying to them. I, are you listening? Are you listening? He's saying, this is going to happen. Okay, it will have an end. Glory days will come again. Okay, so, but this is going to happen. I want you to walk through it rightly. Are you listening? I don't want this to take you down. The, your enemy does. The devil does. You know, I'm paraphrasing for Jesus. I hope that's okay. okay. It's like he's saying that, you know what the devil wants to do through this? He wants to take you out. He wants this to be the end. He told that to Peter. He says, he says Satan has desired you so that he can sift you like we paraphrase. You know what he's saying? He said the devil wants you so he can take you out. And trust me, I don't care how holy you are. I don't care how many people you've won to Jesus. I don't care how many miracles you've seen. I don't care how much you prophesied or how much it, you know, the devil still wants to take you out. But you know what? He can't as long as you hold fast to Jesus. Okay? So listen to what he's saying. These things I'm telling you so that when the time comes, when I get persecuted, when they rip the beard out of my face, when they lay my back, the flesh of my back open, when you see horrors done to me, the one that has healed and done miracles and seems untouchable, when you see these things, and then yes, the unthinkable happens, I literally die and go into the grave. When you see the worst thing you've ever seen happen in your life, here's what I want you to do. Remember, these things I'm telling you so that when the time comes, he's, because you can look it up, he was talking about his, his death, you will remember that I told you, okay? You'll remember. Don't discount the value of remembering, okay? You'll remember that I told you of them, and these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you, okay? He says, you know, I'm, I'm here. You, did, you weren't ready to hear it. There are things the Lord is saying right now to the, to the world, to the planet, to the bride, to the church that he's never said before. If you think the Lord said everything, I, I heard somebody say this the other day, they're still preaching this crazy ideology and theology that everything that God wanted to say to us, he said, and then he put in the Bible. That is so not true. Listen, God is never going to run out of things to say, okay? He's saying things now because you're going through things you've never gone through, and the world is going through things they've never gone through. The Lord is speaking. He says, these things I didn't say to you in that season, but I am now. Okay. He says, uh, but now I go away to him who sent me. Okay. It's like the disciples go, you lost me at go away. <laughs> okay. If the Lord were to come to you two years ago and tell you what you're going through right now, what would you have done? Okay. This is what he's doing to them. He's actually preparing them. 
But now I go away to him that sent me, and none of you asks me where you're going. They were afraid. They didn't really want to know. I don't want to know, okay? Ignorance is bliss. But because I have said these things, sorrow. Do you know it's right to fight sorrow? In the world today, and in the world that's coming tomorrow, and the next day, there will be abundant reasons to embrace sorrow. And we're not talking about the sorrow of God. The Bible talks about that uh, the, the sorrow of God okay, works for repentance. That's different. But the sorrow of the world brings death. Resisting sorrow. Now, I'm not talking about pretending. I'm talking about setting a limit. Like when a loved one dies. You know, the wife of uh, Abraham Lincoln, I forget what her name was. Was it Sarah? I don't know. But when their little boy uh, died, I think it was Tad, when their little boy died, she went into grief, which is normal, right? But that can also be accompanied by a, an overwhelming obsession of, with sorrow. And you embrace it so much that it takes over your life. Sorrow at a certain level is to be resisted. Okay, we talk about how to work through it, and, and I, I get that. I get it, I believe it. There's a lot of you know people who have studied the mind and all I get it. I'm not I'm not hundred percent against you know uh, psychology and, and psychoanalysis and all that. The study of the brain, there's some there's some import there, but do not re forget that you as a believer know that there is not just the mind, but there's the soul. There is spirit, excuse me, that's the same thing, spirit, soul, and body. You have a spirit. There's a spiritual component that's going on. There's a natural. You cannot afford to allow yourself to be consumed with disappointment and sorrow and angst and so on and so on. Jesus says to them right now, I just told you the worst thing that's ever going to happen to you, and sorrow is filling your heart. He's not saying that because he's telling them it's okay. Are you listening? He's not saying that because he's telling him it's okay. He's saying, guys, you're going to walk through this. I want you to walk through it right. I'm not saying pretend it's not happening. The Lord never does that. He never says, hey, I'm going to be on the cross. Just turn away and go, oh, I can't handle that. I'm just going to, I can't, I'm afraid I'm going to be overwhelmed. So I'm just, no, he doesn't do that. He never does that. He says, I want to walk through this with you. I want you to walk through it with intelligence, knowing that I'm never going to leave you or forsake you, even when you're watching the worst thing you've ever seen happen. So it says, I've told you this, and sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. I hope you go back and read this. He says, nevertheless, nevertheless, I'm not going to tell you, hey, it's no big deal. No, he says, it will be a big deal, but I'm going to tell you how to walk through it. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Now think about what he's about to say. This is stunning. This almost seems unkind, okay? Instead of him saying, guys, it's going to be okay. You know, we, we want to make Jesus into this, you know. Oh, you know, and I get that. I understand that. But he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. I've said these things, sorrows filled your heart. Nevertheless, even though you're really sad, I'm going to tell you the truth anyway. Sorry, I'm going to tell you the truth anyway. It is to your advantage that I go away. <laughs> I mean, I could never get away with this. I never. So, you know, you, you talk to people. Okay, this huge crisis is going to happen to you. It's for your good. Thank you very much, Jesus. How many of you would be okay with that? You know, you think of the worst thing you've ever gone through or maybe you're going through right now and having Jesus come and say, son, daughter, it's to your advantage that this happens. <laughs> Nevertheless, he says, I'm going to tell you the truth. If you hate me for it, if you don't believe me, if you don't like it, I am telling you so that one day you'll believe me that this thing is going to work out to your advantage in the end. In the process, maybe not. In the midst of it, maybe tears. In the, in the crushing, nobody likes crushing. He's not telling you to like the crushing. He's saying, fix your eyes on what's going to happen because that will help you to walk through this correctly. Again, let's come back to those questions. What does your enemy want you to do? He wants you to lose your faith. He wants you to stop believing what you believed your whole life. He wants you to question God to the place to where you have separation because you're believing that he's not good and so on and so on. And 
and we talked earlier about the cooperating. One of the reasons, you know, this is so important, honey, is because it's not just about you. How can you go out and share that same level of confidence with someone else? If you, uh, if we allow, I'm going to say we, if we allow the enemy to consume us with sorrow, consume us with disappointment, we get so focused on we want this thing to come to an end, which of course we do, that we have nothing to give anybody. I know that you're probably not doing that. And you want the best. And you want to do the best. But this is why Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's your advantage. You, know, you may not see it now, but one day you will. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And then he points them to the Holy Spirit. And this is so important. Because the primary work, and I'm going to leave you right now with, with a... Um, I don't know, like a golden nugget that may not seem like it applies to you personally. And again, not everything has to apply to me personally, okay? There is great benefit in understanding what God is doing with the world, not just with my world, okay? <clears throat> and he talks about the Holy Spirit. How many of you are as familiar with the Holy Spirit as you'd like to be? I am not, okay? I confess, I want to be more intimate with the Holy Spirit. I feel like I have a level of intimacy with Jesus. And the Father, but the Holy Spirit, <laughs> kind of third in line, I guess. And, and I want that. I want more of that. And when you listen to the link I put on, you'll hear him talk about uh, reaching for what he's preaching. And I, I think if we told the truth, we would all say there's more. We know there's more. That's my, that's my last name, more. Okay, We're always reaching. So I'm going to tell you right now what the Holy Spirit is doing in the world. Because I don't know if you realize there's actually a scripture, a passage. You're about to read it where it does say, for all time and eternity, what the Lord, the Holy Spirit's doing in the world. Are you ready for this? Okay. Three things. I know you've read it before. Three things it says the Holy Spirit is doing today in the world. Right now, in your world, and in the world around you. Listen to what it says. It says, I'll send the Holy Spirit, and He, when He comes, He will do three things. He will convict. He will... Uh, excuse me, he'll convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, the three things that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, is doing are all based on conviction. He didn't say, I'm going to convict the world, and then I'm going to bless the world, and then I'm going to touch the world. That's not what he said. Okay. I, he says, everything the Holy Spirit's going to do once I ascend to the Father is based in a single word. Maybe you've never seen this. He will convict the word and then he breaks the world and then he breaks it up into three things. The entire ministry of the Holy Spirit is about convincing. So if you're reading the King James or the New King James, it says convict. If you read other translation, it says convince, to convince. That is actually both of those words. That's accurate. You know, we talk about the Holy Spirit conviction, and really with that, for us, that means we kind of feel bad, and it's from God. Okay? It's the opposite of condemnation. We're not feeling bad. You know, Satan condemns. That's feeling bad because the devil's doing it. Conviction, that's kind of feeling godly sorrow because God is doing it. That's not, I mean, there's, yes, that's true. That is, that's true. I don't want to take away from that. But in this context, that's not really what he's talking about. Yes, when he convinces the world of these three things, Typically, they're going to feel bad about it, you know, at least initially, you know, godly sorrow. Yeah, because they're not doing it, you know, or they didn't believe it or whatever. But the word convince, it is a judicial word. OK, so when you have someone that's sitting in uh, in a trial and the lawyers battle over whatever, and then that the jury is convinced that that person is either guilty or innocent, the gavel comes down, and then there is a conviction. Now, we tag that onto they're guilty, but in this case, it means the, the, the person, which is you or me or whoever you happen to be talking to, that waitress in the, in the restaurant or whatever, they become convinced. This is, now, Jesus said, you know, he's going to tell about me. Right, right. He's going to convince the world of these three things as they apply to the life of Jesus. Okay? So the, the work of the Holy Spirit, have you ever heard this before? The work of the Holy Spirit is convincing. That's what he's out doing. He's doing it through you. He's doing it to you. One of the reasons you need to be convinced so you can help convince others. It is the job of the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, the job description of the Holy Spirit, one word, one word, convince. Convince. He wants to convince your kids, your grandkids about Jesus. He wants to convince you. He wants to convince all of us. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing. Okay, convince. And then he breaks it down into three things, three super foundational. Okay, what the Holy Spirit's doing has got hundreds, hundreds, thousands, millions of different you know, branches reaching out, but he, like God likes to do, he brings it down to three absolute foundational issues, okay? Out of which everything else grows. You know, look at maybe three trees, I guess. I don't know. Three things. I'm going to convince the world of three things, okay? Of sin. Now, each one of these things, and this is, I'm going to have to stop because this would take a whole lesson. Maybe I'll come back to this Wednesday. The world needs to be convinced about how God views sin. Not just what sin is, but God's remedy for sin. Okay? So again, remember, this is a broad, broad declaration. This is a broad reference. Okay? The subject of sin is how it came, what it does, how to get rid of it. You know, there's a big, big understanding of that one thing. And it's all, all three of these things are directly connected to the Son of Man, okay? How Jesus sees sin, how Jesus delivers, how Jesus forgives, how he deals with it once we're saved from all of the past, and yet we still stumble all of it. A big pit. He wants to convince the world about Jesus's view of sin. And of course, the primary thing, how he, you know, the cross. So he's going to convince the world of the need for Jesus dying and going to the cross. Okay, that's one. That's the He's going to convince the one thing. Then the second one, and then he explains it. I can't go in because they don't believe in me. What does sin have to do with believing in Jesus? Well, he's he's the guy. He gets to say, right? Okay. They don't believe in me, so they don't have an accurate view of how I have dealt with sin. Okay. And then the next thing, he says, of righteousness. Okay. Because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Sin, righteousness, judgment. I have to abbreviate this because I have to be done. Sin, righteousness, judgment. Those are the three components of every human being's existence. Okay, how do we deal with sin? Sin's a reality. It separates. It's not good. It hurts, whatever. It perishes, you know, whatever. How do we deal with that? I've already dealt with it. If they know about me, they'll understand. Uh, righteousness. What does it mean to be righteous? Okay. Well, it is doing good, right? I mean, it, practically speaking, if you go out and kill your neighbor, that's not righteous, okay? Don't, let's not be dumb about it, okay? Don't be foolish about it. But at the same time, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. His blood cleanses us. He sees us through that. The world needs to know that their sin problem has been dealt with, and now they can pursue knowing the Lord like they were created to without living in fear and condemnation. That's what he wants to convince the world of. And then number three, of judgment. Well, what's he, what does he want to convince the world about judgment for? I thought we're not going to be judged anymore. No, that's not accurate either. Okay, yes, Jesus bore our judgment. He bore our sin. He bore our punishment. But judgment means different things for different people. If a person rejects what God has done for the forgiveness of their sin, they still have to answer for that. That's Bible. If they have accepted what Jesus has done, when they go to stand for the Lord, they're not answering the sin question anymore. It's already been answered. But they still are going to give an account for their life. They're going to stand for the Lord, and he says he's going to do a review of our life. He's going to show us where we got right, where we got wrong. He's going to reward us according to what we did good. It says that in the book of Romans. Or, you know, again, we are not get punished for sin if sin is forgiven. You'll never get punished for sin that's been forgiven. Never. Ever, 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 ever. Okay? But you will. If there's a certain thing you miss, say, well, you know, I know I got forgiven for this, but I still hated my brother. The Lord says, okay, got a problem with that. Okay, All right, I got to be done. I hope this helped you today. It's not always easy to believe that the crushing, the brokenness that you're going through has an expected end and a purpose. He's not doing it to you, okay, but he is with you while you're going through it. I beg you to listen to the link. It may not touch you like it did me, but it was very helpful for me. So, all right. Yes, Dana, thank you. That's absolutely true. Consequences. Okay. All right. Love you guys. Thank you for listening today. Pray that you have a great day. Papa, bless your people with the spirit of wisdom and revelation and understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys, for listening. Tomorrow is Justice for America. And, uh, 
Facebook I'm is let me do it. Yeah, you can join me tomorrow. It's going to be good. We're going to talk about some social issues and how the Lord feels about it. So love you guys. Give yourself permission to have a great day. Bye-bye.